Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. Welcome back to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast. I have yet another Bible study ready for you from the book of Haggai, or at least launching off from the book of Haggai. This, this again, won't actually start in the book of Haggai. And again, we won't spend that much time in the book of Haggai. Not yet. Uh, if you've been following this, you've probably had your fill of Haggai, Ezra, Daniel, <laughs> and all these other books that are directly related. Today's study from the book of Haggai is about Jeshua the high priest. So far, we've had videos that covered the life and biographical sketch of Darius the king, Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and today is Jeshua the high priest, also known as Joshua the high priest. And as far as I can tell, we are first introduced to Joshua or Jeshua uh, in Ezra chapter 2. Ezra cha chapter 2 and verse 1 now, these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that, which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one into his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Re Relaiah, Mordecai, B Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Reham, Bena, the number of the men, uh, the number of the men of the people of Israel. So Jeshua is named in that company. We read or we learned uh, last week, last Monday, in the last broadcast about Zerubbabel, also known as Shesh Bazar. Um, he was he was appointed governor by Judah and then commanded to lead the people back to Jerusalem. Well, Jeshua was among that group that came back. That's important to note. He. He ended up being a prominent figure, as we're going to see when we go through uh, the, the, the book of Haggai, or we go through this, uh, this sketch of his background and his life. Now, there was quite a bit to piece together when it came to Zerubbabel and even Darius. There's not quite as much information about Jeshua in terms of where he came from, who he is, who he might be, who he could be, and, and the arguments for or against that possibility. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. He's Jeshua, the high priest. He came back with Zerubbabel. Now, under the leadership of Jeshua and Zerubbabel, the altar of God was built and worship to God was restored in Jerusalem. That is unbelievably important. And, and we're going to talk about a few things related to that. Let me, let me first read to you Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God, of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they, and they set the altar upon his bases for fear was upon them because the people of those countries and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. So they get back to Jerusalem 
And, and this is incredible. It's an idea that we need to discuss and that we need to look at. I, I want to read uh, uh, one more passage to you before I, I try to develop something that, that I think is extremely important here. Um, they get back to Jerusalem. Under the leadership of Jeshua and Zerubbabel, the altar of God is restored. That's extremely, extremely important. Uh, now, now they can at least reestablish a sense of worship. And if you've listened to these other broadcasts, we've said repeatedly, today, Israel can't do that. There is no altar. They couldn't, they couldn't put the altar back in its place if they wanted to. It's not an option. It's not available to them. Um, that's why it's so important to witness to Jews during, we live in currently what we would call the, the dispensation of grace. It's, it's the time of the body of Christ, the church. And as such, people need to be saved including Jews. They cannot worship in accord with the law of Moses. It's not an option. They have no temple. They have no altar. The, the, the temple's not in its base, on its basis. It's not in its place. The, the altar's not on its basis and in its place. There's no foundation. There is nothing in place for the Jews to be able to worship the way that God commanded them to worship. You'll notice here, and I've mentioned it in every broadcast so far, they tried to reestablish worship in accord with the law of Moses. That's not an option for them today. When they came back to Jerusalem, there was not a mosque sitting where the temple is supposed to be. There's one sitting there today. Uh, so a lot has to happen before Israel can, can restore Jewish worship in accord with the law of Moses. Um, they need to trust in Jesus Christ. Right now is the time for as many people as possible to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that your sins can be forgiven, your soul can be saved, and you become a part of the body of Christ. And you get in on that, on the blessings that come to the church. The church in Israel, the church in, in Judah, the church in Israel, they're not the same thing. They are miles apart. And so it's, it's, it is essential at this point in time that we do all that we can to get the gospel to everyone, including Jews. They are not excluded from the need to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not trying to convince them necessarily he's their Messiah. Though it is true that Christ is the Messiah, and as the Messiah, he died as was, as was prophesied of him. What's important is that they understand Christ, the Son of God, died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. We can work out the doctrinal details later. Right now, you need to know who Jesus Christ is, what he did for you on that cross, that he didn't stay on that cross. He didn't stay in the grave. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And God has promised, no matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, if you'll trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he will save your soul, period. And so that's, that's where we are. That's what needs to happen. Now, Zerubbabel and Jeshua are said to have appointed the Levites in their place and then set forward the work of the house of God. It wasn't enough to get the altar in, in its place. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. It needed to be there, but the work is not done. You got to press on. In Ezra 3, verses 8 through 9, now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel and Jeshua the son of Jehozadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from twenty years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Henadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. Now twice... In Ezra chapter 3, Jeshua is said to have stood, and twice he is said to have set forward the work of God. And it is indicative of the type of leadership that is desperately needed today. Now, if we leave, if we take this principle from Judah that is applied to, to, the, to Judah, the tribe, the, the southern kingdom, the, the, the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that's who God's talking to. That's what he's talking about. But let's move that principle forward to the New Testament church. <laughs> Leadership is greatly lacking in, in a desperate way on a large scale. Uh, you have 
you know, you're more likely to find a female who claims to be a pastor or a preacher today than you are a man. That, that's, it's sad, it's ungodly, it's not right, and needs to be fixed. Now, it's easy to attack the women who are usurping, who are usurping authority in, in ways that God said not to. It's very easy to, to target them and say, you're overstepping your bounds, and they are. They should, they should go read what the, what the Bible says about women assuming that position of authority, of authority. They should repent of having taken that authority upon themselves, and they should move back into where God instructed them to go. This is not belittling to women. This is not disrespectful to women. We have reached a, we have reached a place in our current world where confusion so abounds, you don't even know what a woman is anymore. Now, the Bible is not confused, and the Bible didn't change, and the Bible is not trying to keep up with modern-day morality or the lack thereof. The Bible does tell you what will happen if you allow confusion to abound. You might end up in a place where women are, are, do that which is unnatural and men do that which is unnatural and, and leave the, men, you know, the man and the woman and go after each other. I would say we have, we have more than arrived in that place. So when women overstep the boundaries that God put on them, and men don't step up to the boundaries that God put on them. Confusion abounds. The word of God fails. There becomes a drought of the word of God. There becomes a drought in leadership. There becomes a lack of men willing to do what God told them to do. This is, it is every bit belittling to a man as it is to a woman if that woman usurps authority that doesn't belong to her and that man doesn't step up to the leadership that does belong to him. It's a failure on the man's part to not do what God said in terms of leading, and it's a failure on the woman's part to not recognize the, the, the incredible place that God has given women. Now, I, I understand when you use the word women and place together, that's, that's going to stir some mixed emotions. It shouldn't. The only reason your emotions would be confused by such a statement is because you're more influenced by the ideologies of this world than you are by the word of God. And when you hear a man say that women have a place designated by God, it causes you to, to kind of curl up and, and, and to feel awkward because you've been convinced by watching television, listening to music, watching the news, doing everything but study, read, and focus on the word of God. And that's what's caused your emotions to be out of line. You should bring your body into subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the word of God. God put men in positions of leadership. Not because they are somehow greater than women or better than women. That's, that's, that, when that becomes your, your, your focus, you're way off track. That is not the point. The point is not which is better and which is greater. The point is that God established an order an important order. And when that order is recognized and adhered to, it creates a beautiful situation in which people and families flourish in righteousness. When that order is ignored, well, you have fatherless children, you have women who are abused, you have confusion, women who think they're men, men who think they're women, men who date men, women who date women, all sorts of perverted confusion will abound when something as simple as a man shall not wear that, pertain that, that which pertains to a woman, a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man, uh, a man is in a position of leadership and women are not to usurp authority over men when, when little basic details like those are not adhered to, well, then you get to just make it up as you go. And, and I guarantee you the world is making it up as they go. As Christians, again, we don't get to adhere to, we don't get to, we don't get to su subject the word of God to our feelings, especially feelings being forced upon, the, upon us by the world. And the only reason those feelings are allowed to be forced upon you is because you're spending time looking at things and listening to things that do not profit you. Now, I can't tell you what to listen to and what not to listen to. I can make some suggestions if you were interested in that. But if you're already <laughs> at odds with this video and we're only a few minutes into it, you probably don't want my suggestions about what to and not to listen to. 
God created a beautiful order as to how things should work. And when we strive to do things within those boundaries, everything works wonderfully. When you step outside those boundaries, that which is unnatural abounds. Confusion abounds. Suicide abounds. Emotional instability abounds. Psychological and, and, and mental defects abound. So we need men who will step up, who will stand up and set forward the work in the house of God, who will set forward the work of God and get it going and get the crowd moving in the right direction. We read in, in, in Ezra 3, verses 1 through 3, that the, the people had gathered themselves together as one man unto Jerusalem. Well, when God's people are gathered together, what, what should happen? Somebody needs to step up and get the, get the, the gathering moving in the right direction. And that starts with the worship of God. And, and again, the worship of God in accord with the word of God. We don't just make it up as we go and decide, you know, I, I think this would make people happy or I don't think God would mind if we, if we abandon that and do this. That, that, none of that is going to work. None of that is acceptable. You got to set forward the work of God in accord with the word of God. And we need men, 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 men to step up, to lead your family, to lead your church, to lead your community, to lead your society, to lead your nation, to lead this world. And a lack of men willing to do that has caused us to end up in many ways in the place where we are today. Uh, the, the Bible says, woe unto you when women and children become your rulers. It's not a good thing. See, the world thinks the more, the more that we get women involved in these positions of leadership, the more progressive we are, the, the better things will be, and women will be better represented. <laughs> okay. It's your world. I'm just a stranger and a pilgrim passing through. But I'm telling you, the God that created this world set a natural order to it, and if you continue to violate that natural order, you're going to cause your family, your community, your society, your nation, and this world, a lot of trouble. And the source of all trouble everywhere you look, it comes from places where people are in direct odds with what God said to do every time, in every place. Now, I understand that idea is not going to be very popular or likable, in today's world, I don't even know. YouTube didn't didn't like my uh, video on critical race theory, so we'll see how long we'll see what they do with this one. <laughs> um, but I I can't be concerned about your your feelings and your emotions regarding these ideas. I have a biblical responsibility to teach these ideas. It comes from the Word of God. Jeshua and Zerubbabel stood up and set forward the work of God. That's good godly leadership. But we're going to see in a moment that leadership broke down. That leadership began to fail. So in Ezra 3, 8, he set forward the work of the house of the Lord. In Ezra 3, 9, he set forward the workmen in the house of God. And in Ezra 3, 9, Joshua stood and set forward the workmen. In Ezra 3, 2, Joshua stood and builded the altar of the God of Israel. So Joshua became the driving force behind behind Israel or Judah accomplishing what they what God had sent them back to accomplish. And there has to be that person. There has to be that that person in a church and in a family who says this is our focus, the word of God, the work of God. And and we're going to we're not just going to be we're not just going to be casual about this. We're going to live with a, with a certain purpose and a certain intent that, that says our family is going to continually become more Christ-like, more, we're going to get more focused on witnessing. We're going to get more focused in our Bible reading and in our Bible study. And we're going to do everything we can to set forward the work of God in our lives, in our church, at my work, at, at what, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You, there has to be that person who says, okay, we, we finished the altar. Now what? How, you know, we got to get the foundation done. How are we going to do that? When are we going to do it? 
Let's start setting dates. Let's start setting goals. Let's get things done and not just sit around and act like souls are not dying and going to hell. We have no time for complacency. And we are already way behind in several battles around the world because we just kind of we just kind of got comfortable. And we began to live as though, I mean, everything is okay. Look how good our country is. Look how safe our country is, specifically in terms of America. Why do we need to do anything else? I mean, God's been so good to us. What I mean, we could just kind of kick back and coast to the end. That's a very irresponsible idea. Jeshua stood up and said, Let's we gotta have an altar. Let's get the altar going, get, get the altar going right now. Okay, the altar is built. Now what? Well, let's start worshiping. Let's get continual burnt sacrifices. We gotta get going. We've got to get moving. We've got to make that we gotta we have to stay on top of things and stay focused and do our best to do what we can to please God and to serve God here and now until we step out into eternity. We have no time for, for relaxing and, and coasting and kicking back and, and doing nothing. We just, it's not an option for us. It, this is urgent. Confusion abounds. The wages of sin is still death. People are still dying. And they're dying without Jesus Christ because we have, we have too many wide expanses of territory where there are not men willing to set forward the work of God to stand up and say, let's get busy. We need you to get busy. Everybody needs to get busy. we got to stay focused on the work in front of us. Now, now, this was mentioned in previous broadcasts, and I know some of this might seem redundant, but, you know, it's a blessing. It'll stir up your pure minds by way of remember, mem- remembrance. You get to see the same thing over and over from a different angle and a different context related to different people. It's a good thing. And if you can stomach it and you can stand it and you can follow along, it's a blessing. And you'll notice that what I said in probably the last couple of broadcasts, and it'll probably be mentioned again before it's over with, that as soon as they got busy working on that foundation, then came trouble. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's just how it is. That's just, this is, this is not our world, but we're expected to function and to live and to minister in a world that hates God. And, in ter- and because it hates God, they're going to hate you. Jesus Christ couldn't have said it any more clearly. If they have hated me... <laughs> They are definitely going to hate you. So we can't move forward with the expectation that there will not be trouble. There is, there is going to be trouble every time. Now, we should thank God for when there is no trouble. But we should move forward expecting that there's just going to be trouble. It's just how it is. That's where we are. That's what we have to deal with. It's, it's, it is our burden to carry It is not reason for us to feel sorry for ourselves or to fail to do what God has asked us to do. we got to do the work of God. You've got to press on. We have to stay focused. We have to stay busy. We have to do what God wants us to do. It It is essential that we press past the adversity and stay focused on the Lord. Look, if you have your Bibles, look at Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, now that's a heck of a way to be, you know, if I could describe this group of people, oh, they are the adversaries. <laughs> that's how God looked at it. They are the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. That's just, the Lord was like, how do I describe these people? What can I, oh, just, they're, they're adverse to anything that belongs to God. <laughs> they are the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. When they heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple, under the Lord God of Israel. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. For we seek your God as you do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esau Haddon, king of Asser, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and, and Jeshua and the rest of the children of the fathers of Israel said unto them, ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. That's the proper response. Now, could they have been more tactful? <laughs> Maybe. I, I have been told numerous times in my life, you should learn to fight your battles. <laughs> you should learn to pick your battles a little more clearly. 
and maybe be a little more tactful. And I have found in the times where I have heeded that advice, it, it tends to work out pretty good. Uh, when I don't, <laughs> it could go either way. But was this the most tactful answer? No. Was it the right answer? Yes. Could there have been a better way to tell them? Sure. Absolutely. But generally what happens today is people look for the, the, the easy road out and and create some, some beautiful, well-meaning, ecumenical movement that ends up descending into chaos and ungodliness. And we're not interested in that. We want what we're doing for God to be pure, to be righteous, to be holy. And we make enough mistakes on our own to invite a bunch of pagan fools in to, to, to build with us or to work with us, only to find years down the road that you couldn't find God in anything we're doing. We have enough trouble staying focused by ourselves. We don't need to invite extra, an extra lack of focus, an extra distraction. So you have nothing to do with us to build a house under our God. But we ourselves together will build under the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So, Jeshua and Zerubbabel, they gave the right answer. You don't have anything to do with this. If you want to convert and, and believe the truth, then we'll help bring you along. But you're not just going to jump in here and, and, and you know, we're going to let your views be heard and let your views be heard. This is not, a, this is not an open forum. We're going to listen to God. It's not that you're going to listen to me. We are going to listen to God. And if your opinions and ideas disagree with that of God's, we're going to abandon yours and we're going to believe God. If mine disagree with God, I'm going to abandon my ideas and I'm going to trust in God. Oftentimes when witnessing to people, uh, particularly in America, they'll ask you a question and then they'll tell you, but don't, don't use the Bible to answer. <laughs> I mean, what an, what an idiotic thing to do. That'd be like me telling, telling them, answer my question, but don't use Richard Dawkins. <laughs> because that's where they get all their information. They come up all the time and they say, you know, the Bible's not true. And so I, or the Bible's full of contradictions. So I'll hand them my Bible and I'll say, I'll tell you what. I want you to show me one contradiction, just one, that you found while reading the Bible. Here are the rules. You're not allowed to use a, a, a Richard Dawkins book and you're not allowed to use some atheist website or YouTube channel. I want you to show me a contradiction that you found while you were reading the Bible. And that, that ends every one of those conversations because they've never read the Bible. They heard someone say there are contradictions in the Bible. Rather than verifying whether there were indeed contradictions in the Bible, they just believed what the person said and used it as though, and, 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 and took it and put it into their, their ammo as though it was proper ammo to use against a Christian. But then when they run into a Christian who challenges their statements, they end up looking like complete fools because they never looked, they never verified, they never checked, they didn't study, they were not reading, they knew nothing about the Bible, they only knew what someone told them about the Bible, so then they stand there looking silly because they, they made an assertion they could not prove. And it's our job to challenge those assertions. And it's our, job to, it's our job to study. You should know your Bible so that when people make those types of, of statements, you can immediately respond. You, you have a foundation from the Word of God to say, no, that's not true. You're misusing that. You don't understand what you're talking about. Let me show you. Or you show me what you're talking about from the Bible. And that will most certainly never happen. But you should be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. That answer doesn't come it doesn't magically pop into your mind. You got to study. You got to study to show yourself approved unto God and to, and to be ready. Now, the the problem the problem here with Jeshua and Zerubbabel, the problem is not necessarily their answer. It was a harsh answer. It, it was it was a bit maybe over the top. It was overzealous. Uh, you know, probably something I would be guilty of. I I have no problem admitting that. I could see that. The problem was that 
Up to this point, the leadership has been strong. Zerubbabel led the people back. He brought the vessels of God. He accounted for the people. Jeshua stood up and set forward the work on the altar. Then he stood up again and set forward the work on the foundation of God. Now the foundation is laid, and as soon as it's laid, trouble comes. Well, in like manner, with that, that same type of leadership, they tell their adversaries, you don't have anything to do with this. We are building the house of our God. Well, that all worked out well until, until the pressure got, got heated. It says here that they troubled them in the building of the house of God. Okay, no problem. We can handle a little trouble. It's probably good for you. I don't want trouble. <laughs> I, I don't want to be put, uh, it, it, as it were, in a furnace and left there to, 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 uh, to go and, and, you know, to be burned until the dross is gone and the gold is left. And the silver is left. <laughs> That's not a fun process, but it's probably, unfortunately, a necessary process. That seems to be a biblical principle. It's, it's you know, and not only so, but we glory through tribulations also. Who glories through tribulations? Well, we're supposed to. That's supposed to be us. That tribulum would go, would go, would be slammed down into the wheat, and it would rip out what was not, what was not supposed to be there. That's tribulation. Now, this is not the tribulation. Don't, don't get confused here. We're not talking about the tribulation or the great tribulation. We're talking about just difficulty in everyday life. And, and part of that difficulty is going to come when you try to stand up for God and do something for God, and the world around you says, okay, let's put that to the test. And Joshua and Zerubbabel failed when they were put to the test. The, the intensity became great, and in Ezra chapter 4, letters were written to the Persian kings. Um, Ahasuerus didn't respond. Artaxerxes did respond, and he says, you force that work to stop, and you force it to stop now. And they allowed, they allowed themselves, they allowed this world to put them in a position to where they were, they were unwilling to back up what they were saying. They said, we're going to build this house. We don't care what you say. We don't care what you do. We are building this house. That's not what ended up happening. And that difference is significant. It's very important to note. So this went on until God got involved. Now, we're not going to look at it today. I'm, I'm certain we'll look at it in more detail as we start going verse by verse through the book of Haggai. And you might be thinking to yourself, man, this is going to go on for years. That's okay. I love it. I enjoy it. And this is a Bible study, you know, a problem I have always had in life is I get bogged down in details. That's just a part of my personality. I can get, I can get so bogged down in details that it, that it, at times it can hinder me from accomplishing uh, certain tasks. Sometimes getting bogged down in the details is a great thing. Sometimes it's not good at all. If you have a boss who wants you to finish a job speedily, it's not good to get bogged down in details. You got to get the work done. Bible study is an area where I can get as bogged down as I absolutely want to get. And if you enjoy coming along for the ride, you are welcome. If you don't, I fully understand. I get it. But I'm getting bogged down in the details of the Word of God. I love it. I enjoy it. I want to pick it apart. I want to learn every little bit of it that I can. And as long as the Lord allows me to be here to do that, that's what I intend to do. And so in this case, uh, Ezra, uh, uh, in the book of Ezra, uh, Zerubbabel and, and Jeshua, they, they allowed the work to get shut down. Their, their leadership had been strong to this point. Now we've hit rock bottom. We've hit failure. God allowed them to go on, it seems like, for years saying nothing to them. And if you look in the book of Haggai and you read what God said to them, which we'll look at some of it in a moment, um, he just allowed them to suffer the consequences of their decision, the consequences of their neglect of God. And there are consequences to neglecting God in your life. You're not going to lose your salvation. You don't cease to, to have your sins forgiven. None of, that, none of those are consequential of, of a lack of focus, of proper focus on God. If you're saved, your sins are forgiven. That doesn't mean you don't get in ruts and, and have moments of separation from your Father in heaven. Uh, 
that doesn't that but that's not attached to a loss of salvation that's a loss of fellowship that's a loss of direction that's a loss of joy peace the 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 fruits of the spirit you lose those things rewards god's promised you rewards in heaven based on your faithfulness here and now in certain areas of life uh, you could lose those rewards when you get to heaven you know that that's that is where the loss is and th- that loss is unnecessary then there are consequences in your daily life. If you read in Haggai chapter 1, you go and you earn money to put it in a bag with holes in it. I brought a drought upon your labor, upon your land, upon your, your, your crops, on everything. I just, I, just, I, I just cause you to have an unbelievably hard time because the way of the transgressor is hard. <laughs> life is set up in such a way that when you violate the word of God, when you live in unrighteousness, if you live in sin and in transgression, your life is going to be hard that's where heart that's that's primarily where hardness in life comes from not not altogether and that's not uh that's not a complete statement that but you can guarantee that if there is difficulty in your life if there is difficulty uh uh coming into your life into your world there's a good chance that your sin or someone else's sin could be causing the situation and it'd be good to repent be good to move on. It'd be good to get the sin out of out of our lives, <laughs> rather than rather than having God kick back and watch and see how long you're going to squirm under the consequences of your decisions, <clears throat> before He finally has to step in and intervene and send a prophet your way and correct you. That's why the Bible says to humble yourself under the mighty ha- mighty hand of God. It'd be better for us to do it ourselves rather than having God, rather than forcing God to be put in a position to do what is necessary to humble you. It's, it's better that we humble ourselves. And Judah got focused on themselves. Judah got internally focused. They, they, they were not building the house of God, but they were building their own houses. They, they, let the house of God go, go to waste, but their own houses were unbelievably nice. And God wasn't going to have it. So he rose up prophets to deal with it. So in Ezra chapter 5, we get a synopsis of this, verses 1 through 2. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Now, this is a rare thing. <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing, but it's a rare thing. They had gotten, they had gotten off track. They had lost their focus on what God instructed them to do. That's easy to do, especially in a world so full of distractions today. It is easy to get off track. We've got to do all that we can to stay focused on God, on the word of God, to do everything we can to accomplish the work he has given us to do before we pass from this life to the next. But man, it is easy to get off track. You've got to continually stay focused. They got off track. God sent prophets to prophesy to them. And this is the rarity. It's not rare to get off track. What's rare is they heard the preaching of these preachers and they repented and did what God said. Now we're going to examine the preaching more in depth when we get into the book of Haggai verse by verse, but it's such a rare thing to have for a preacher to go and have to sit down. And if you look at what God said in the book of Haggai, it is unbelievably direct and unbelievably personal. If you preach like that to most congregations today, they would lose their minds. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua did not. They listened to the preaching, and then they did what God said. Isn't that an incredible thing? I wonder what your life and what my life would look like if we sat down, carefully examined the Bible-believing men who preach to us, and then altered our life in accord with the preaching of the word of God. (laughs) 
God would bless that. God blessed these people because they repented and got to work and began doing what God told them to do years before. And God blessed the work of their hands. God helped them. God showed them favor. Um, He didn't take their trouble away, but he sure helped them through it. And I, I submit that he would do the same for you and I if we would, in like manner, focus on the same. And so... Now, we, we looked at just a few minutes ago, they began rebuilding the temple of God. They get the altar built. They get the foundation laid. And as soon as they start working on that foundation, here comes trouble. Now, <laughs> here they are rebuilding the temple again. They've restarted for the second time. And immediately, listen, listen to the wording, Ezra 5, verses 3 through 5, at the same time. That's incredible, and that's indicative of probably what's going to happen. Uh, a brother and I here in Uganda have been witnessing to people, and he's learned a new phrase that we use in Deland, Florida often. Then cometh the devil. It is inevitable. You, you begin preaching the gospel to somebody, and they, and they all of a sudden show this hunger and this, this desire to know more and this this need to understand what you're saying. And you can see in their heart and mind as you're talking to them that this is making sense. This is what I've been looking for. Only to have their best friend come along and say, we got to go. Their family to come along and say, we got to go. A semi truck come by honking the horn and, and, and the engine so loud you can't talk anymore. Something is going to happen to cause, to, to try and break the interest of this person standing in front of you. Last Wednesday, we went out preaching the gospel. That happened three times in a row with three different people. Then cometh the devil. It just, it seems to never fail. It seems to be part of the natural order of this world. You get someone who's, one of the young men, I, he was terrified. He he came to fully understand that that he was on his way to hell and he wanted help. And someone from the military began yelling at us to social distance. A man who didn't even have a mask on himself, he's rushing to put his mask on so he can yell at us to socially distance. And right next to him is a group of people who, who are crowded right on top of each other with no mask on, but they're probably talking about politics or football or something useless. But 20 feet away, there are three people standing there talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And something in that that man in the military's mind said, I got to break that up. (laughs) Then cometh the devil every time. And here they are, Ezra 3, or Ezra 5, verses 3 through 5. At the same time came to them, Tatnai, governor of this side of the river, and Shethar Bosnai and their companions, and said, Thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house? And to make up this wall. Then said we unto them after this manner, uh, what are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius and they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Now, that's verses three through five. Look at, uh, look at, Ezra 5, verse 8, 8 through 13. Be it known unto the king that we, that we went into the province of Judea to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones and timber is laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. Then asked we those elders and said unto, unto them thus, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We ask their names also to certify thee that we might write the, the names of the men that were of the chief um, of them. And thus they returned answers saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. But after that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven under wrath. He gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away into Babylon. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build the house 
of God. Now, the only difference between their decision to build now in light of adversity and their decision to build before in light of adversity was before they allowed the world to shut them down. This time, they have decided we are not going to be stopped. We are going to build the house of God. And God was so pleased by that that he responded. If you read in Haggai, which we, we'll look at in a second, we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of it. That's It's really not our focus here. I just want you to see the progression of, of Jeshua as we move to the book of Haggai. Um, they refused to be stopped. They refused to be stopped, and God, God, in light of that, not before that, in light of that, God blessed their work and showed them favor and allowed them to push through the adversity. He didn't take the trouble away, but he, he, he so altered the situation that they were able to work through it, and they finished the temple of God. That's tremendous. That's a blessing. That should be a huge lesson to us. And, and I've probably mentioned it before and may mention it again before it's over with. We do things backwards. God saw their, their repentance and their obedience. And because of that, God said, I am with you. And, and God showed them favor. And God came along beside them and helped them to build the house of God. What we do is we say, God, if you would take away the trouble, if you would stir my heart, and if you would be with me, then I might go do something for you. God said, if you would go do what I've, what I've asked, I might come along beside you and help you. And so we, we tend to turn things around and, and try our best to do it backwards. Now, this, of course, takes us to the book of Haggai, where we get a clear picture of what was preached, how the people responded, and then how God responded to the people's repentance. Look at Haggai 1, verses 1 through 5. Um, you'll see that this picks up where Haggai, and, uh, Haggai himself begins to preach. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house lie waste. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's a heck of a message to receive from God. You, you don't want God showing up and telling you and your people, you better consider your ways. Uh, you're, you're out of line. What you're doing is not right. And I'm going to have to do something about it. You don't want that from God. Uh, trust me, you do not want that from God. You, you want to do all that you can to, to, to stay in God's favor, to stay in God's grace. And, and no doubt you're going to struggle. No doubt you're going to make mistakes. Uh, as we'll see when we get in the book of Haggai, God tells them, I am with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you finish this work. But then you get to chapter two and Haggai chapter two, he says, you're a bunch of dirty people. <laughs> but I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you because, because of your attitude of repentance, because your attitude of moving in the right direction. If God was going to use us because of our perfection, every single one of us would be in some serious trouble and it wouldn't happen. But God looks at these people who, who, had, who had disobeyed his word, but repented. God comes along beside them and still corrects them while helping them and, and building them up and moving them in the right direction. And that's the God that we have. That's the mentality that, that, that we should have. And so um, the blessing was that God made clear to them the negative consequences of the decisions they had made. He, he goes and he tells them, here are the consequences of your decision. But uh, they find out that you know, it, it, it seemed to them that neglecting the house of God, setting aside this work and making this ridiculous excuse, well, the time has not come. I mean, it's just not time to build the house of God. When would, when would, when would be a good time to stop serving God? Like, when, when do you reach that point to where you can say, you know, <laughs> I've done all I can do. I, I, God doesn't need me anymore. I don't need God anymore. I, you know, I understand the world is dying and going to hell, but 
but they can, they can stand for me to take a break. It's an idiotic sentiment. It's, it's not, it's not biblical. It's not going to, it's not a, it's not a good approach to the, to the Christian life. So it seemed to them that neglecting the house of God for a measure of time would prove in the end to allow them to get ahead in some way. And they found out their neglect has been the source of their, their neglect of God and their focus on self has been the source of a lot of trouble for them. Uh, the way forward in life is not through self-focus. You're going to be hammered with that idea in this world. They, they are convinced that you are supposed to love yourself, focus on yourself, esteem yourself, self, 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 self. It's all about me. Of, of course, unless you're a white male Christian, then, then you're just, you're, you're condemned already. You're just naturally evil. That, that's the way the world looks at it. Um, you and your, you and your, you know, attachment to guns and Bible. So the way, the way forward is not focus on self. The, this world does not lack self-esteem. Social media has made that abundantly clear. There is no lack of self-esteem in this world. You don't, there, you don't need, you don't need one more second of focus on self. You need to get over yourself and get off yourself and focus on what God said to focus on. So our lives stand and fall on the foundation of God. That that's it. And that doesn't mean success. There are plenty, plenty of lost people are unbelievably successful because they can manage to get up every day and, and focus on the work set before them. They're still going to die and go to hell. The foundation for life is the word of God, period. It, it has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Without it, you, you have no direction. Without it, you're going to be tossed to and fro by the unbelievably ridiculous whims of this world. You might start thinking that a man can participate in female Olympics and that there's nothing wrong with that. And it's so wonderful and progressive. (laughs) It used to be clearly understood. Male bodybuilder, female bodybuilder, light years apart. The two of them don't participate in the same sport against each other because the man is unbelievably stronger than the woman. And so now you're seeing all that play out today What's, what's insane is people trying to pretend that this is okay and you're expected to go along with it. And if you don't go along with it, then you're going to be ostracized and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be the source of trouble. If you don't have a foundation of God and the Bible in your life, you're going to start thinking that men can turn themselves into women and women can turn themselves into men and men can date men and women can date women and humans can date animals and everything else in between is, is going to become mandatory acceptable. Except for those few people who say, I'm sorry, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to set forward the work of God according to the law of Moses. You're going to, you're going to be the outcast. So you got to decide when and where you're going to draw that line and and how you're going to do so. So, uh, you know, prosperity comes through the worship of God. Now, now in in your mind, what you just heard was prosperity and you think, oh, I can make money. I can become rich. No, no. Set your affections on things above. Your treasure should be in heaven. If if your goal is is to prosper in this life, well, maybe you will. Praise the Lord. I hope you do. But what are you going to do when when half the economies in the world crash because you have complete morons running your respective governments? What will happen to your prosperity? You know how many you know how many rich people have gone through the the uh, who, people who have gained prosperity without God, with no help from God, all completely on their own merit and their own focus and their own work, only to have their country cr- completely crumble. And they lose everything. And I hope you don't think that can't happen to you. Now, I, I, believe, you, I believe you should work hard and earn money and, and be good stewards of that money and, and set that money in such a place that it ends up working for you. These are all good things. But your affection should be on things above. And when you start, when you abandon the work of God to go and work on yourself, 
you're going to end up in, you're going to, you're going to find yourself in a very odd, strange, depressed place. And you don't, you don't want to do that. God is not concerned with your personal, personal, physical, temporal prosperity. God's greatest preachers were, were, were impoverished. They had next to nothing. That's not the game. That's not the aim. That's not the goal. But if you want to, if you want God's blessing on your everyday life, you need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then go after maintaining and taking care of your needs and your wants. And we get this idea in our head, you know, if I could just, if I just skip church for a few weeks, I could earn some extra money. I could, I could do these extra things. I'll go back to church when I'm done. In no world could you set God aside and gain. It's not going to happen. It, it, that defies the order that God established in this world. You're not going to gain the way that you think you are. You're not going to help yourself the way, that you, the way that you think you are. So whether you are rich or not is of no consequence to God. He could care less. Should one show themselves willing to seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, then he will take care of that person's needs, not necessarily their prosperity. But God can use lack and scarcity as a means of chastening his people. And you don't, you should not desire that. And the best way to avoid that is to make certain daily with Joshua, with Zerubbabel, you stand for you stand fat you stand up and you set forward the work of god whatever that may be now as christians we're not building a temple we don't even need a building it's a luxury it's nice to have and in today's world it it certainly it certainly fares better if you have a building than if you don't it seems for the most part as long as you live in a free and safe society it it does which which are unbelievably rare around the world and becoming more and more rare around the world. But we're, we're, not, we're not setting out to build something physical. Our focus is to win souls to Christ and teach those souls to Bible and, Lord willing, as best we can, organize those believers together into local assemblies. Now, if they have a building, wonderful. If they don't have a building and have to go hide somewhere, praise the Lord, we can do that too. Christianity has been doing that since its inception. This is nothing new to us. We don't care what you governments out there think you're going to do. You're not going to shut down the work of God. In some of the most strict of countries all around the world, you got people hiding in the shadows, worshiping Jesus Christ, focused on Jesus Christ, despite you, your threats, and your concentration camps. We don't want to be hindered by you. We don't want to be in, in conflict with you. But we are not going to stop worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood for us, for your ego. It's not going to happen. We're going to stand up. We're going to set forward the work of God in every country, every nation, Every prison cell, every concentration camp, everywhere you stick us, you cannot take away the word of God that's hid in our hearts, the Holy Spirit who's sealed within us, and Jesus Christ who's sitting at the right hand of the Father. What would be good for you to do is to recognize this fact and stop fighting against it. If you would leave Christians alone, they would be the best citizens in your country. But when you target them, you're only asking for trouble for yourself. You are setting yourself against the true and living God. It's not me you got to be worried about. <laughs> it's the God of heaven and earth who sit on, who's sitting on his throne and laughing at your ambition to take territories and kingdoms and, and, and parts of the world that don't belong to you. You can, you can, you can take people. You can lock them away. You can torture them. You, you know all the tools you have available to you. It would be good for you not to set yourself against God. Because when God finds a group of people who are faithful in your country under your dominion, you have no idea what God's going to do to you 
because of your persecution of those people. It might be now, it might be later. But as a government, as a power, you do not want to set yourself against God. And so Judah was freed from captivity. They returned to Jerusalem and they started strong, only to find themselves breaking under the pressure of adversity. That's going to happen. This back and forth is probably going to exist on a micro level and a large level in every church. But in time, in time, they repented at the preaching of God's word and they restored the work. And, and initially, Joshua was, was this driving force. We're going to stand up. We're going to set forward the work of God. And then they failed. They heard the preaching of God's prophets and they repented and they got back to work and they finished the temple, the very temple that Jesus Christ himself ended up showing up, showing up to. And it was done by Judah. You know, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. God will use people who want to be used. He will use people that, that have a proper focus on him, on his word I want that to be me. I want that to be you. I want us to do all that we can in this life here and now to serve our God. He is worthy. If it costs us our freedom, if it costs us our lives, I can only imagine heaven will only be what will will be that much sweeter. Now, that's easy to say sitting in this room and the comforts of this room. Now, we are are under a lot of pressure right now in Uganda, and Uganda needs you to pray because things are are getting odd faster than we would like. So we need you to pray, but just what I've laid out here today, that's what we're going to do, and it seems that God's people here in Uganda are willing and ready to do the, the exact same. So... That is Joshua, the high priest, focused on the word of God, doing it the way that they did in the law of Moses. He said, I, I, I want my grandmother's church. That's what he said. When it came time to sing, he said, what did David do? I want to go back and see what David did back then. I want my grandmother's church. I want my grandmother and grandfather's temple. They're focused on God. They're not focused on methods or or contemporary notions. What did God do in the law of Moses? That's what we're going to do. Well, whatever God's people did in the word of God, that's what we're going to strive to do here in Uganda. I'd appreciate your prayer. Sure, thank you for your help. Hope you enjoyed this message. Thank you for listening. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption podcast.